everyone, and welcome to our prime time debate dedicated to implants in the aesthetic zone. Now, to talk about timing options, my co-host Stefan Fickel has invited three specialists. Juan Blanco from Spain. Good evening, Juan. And we have Sven Mulleman and Daniel Buse from Switzerland with us as well. Now, Stefan, could you please introduce what are we talking about tonight? So good evening, Garrett. It's great pleasure to be here and it's, it's just an amazing program. We're going to talk today about timing. And I think this is the most important thing for every clinician. So is it the right way to place an implant immediately? Is it maybe good to delay a case and place the implant late? Or is it good to have something in between, like having an early approach? And I mean, we have different uh, faculties here. We have a periodontist here. We have a prosthodontist here. We have an oral surgeon here. And actually, um, I'm also a periodontist. So Juan, if anything happens, I will definitely be on your side. I'll Thank promise. You. Thank you. So why don't we wrap it up with one case? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what we love as clinicians. So let's start a case. And, um, as I am the, the moderator, I have to start with the case. So, um, guys, I'm going to show you a case which I started, and um, you definitely think twice about what would you do, was it the right approach which I took. And, and along this case, we will unravel the different scenarios we have. So, look at that case. We have two central incisors, two failing central incisors, and now just all the viewers also outside, just think twice, what would you do? And um, let's <coughs> continue to look at the case even more. And if we look at the x-rays, we see there are two completely different scenarios, which, which will actually help us for tonight. Because uh, we have one scenario on the right side, which is definitely complicated. We see <clears throat> it has a root resection. It has probably a deficient buccal bone plate. And the other one looks pretty OK. So there are different scenarios, and this could help us tonight. Mm -hmm. So um, let's go right into the surgery, and uh, we'll definitely look at the surgery. And uh, let's play the video for a second so that everyone sees what I did in that case. So tooth extraction, and Juan, actually, it's also easy for a periodontist to extract the teeth in that case. But look <laughs> at this slide now. You see there's a complete deficient buccal bone plate. Now we're placing the implant as we learned it. We place it into the palatal housing. Of course, this is also something we will discuss we, because we need to anchor these implants and we will need to anchor it in the palatal aspect. Now, we, we continue with placing the implant. You see it's placed into the palatal housing as you see it here. We continue to place the first one um, and now we also place the second one. Same approach, actually what we learned prosthetically driven. Now comes the important part. I have deficient buccal bone plate here. So I'll do grafting. I use a DBBM material here. I use a collagen membrane here. And I stuff it in the, uh, the, the DBBM particles and finalize uh, the, the case with, with healing screws. Now, if we continue the case, this is uh, 24 hours later, uh, I actually placed in a provisional. Actually, we learned that yesterday in the session, how important it could be to immediately provisionalize these cases. So um, actually, this is what I did. I immediately provisionalized this case. And if we follow these cases down the road, and uh, if you look at the clinical sit situation two to three months down the road, I see the first ones here weighing a little bit, the head. This <laughs> is not a good sign for me. But if we look at the situation, we see there's a different healing. We have a little bit of mucosal recession on the right side. And uh, if we look at the uh, next radiographic image, then we'll see it doesn't look so bad. What do you say? Ah, Professor Buza is weighing his head. This is also not a too good sign. But if I want to finalize the case, suddenly I see this complete buccal dehiscence. I see pus. I see suppuration on one implant. And of course, uh, what you do is you do some analysis. This is a CBCT scan. And we see it's a completely different ballpark between mm -hmm. these two implants. One is completely off to the apex, no bone on the buccal side. And the other one is, is perfect, I'd say. It's nice bone on the buccal side. We see at least two millimeters of bone on the buccal side. 
But it's always the same. If it's your implant, your place, you never trust CBCTs. Of you want to see it because you can't believe that in this hands something goes wrong. <laughs> so I flapped it and it you looks went back like in. I went back in. I wanted to know. I don't believe the CBCTs, especially in my cases. So I went in and this is the situation. And let's be honest. This is a complete failure. This is a disaster for the patient, for the surgeon, because we all know this is hardly correctable. So let's set the stage with well, that. Stefan, kicking off with a very interesting case. Absolutely. Right? And so my first question would be to Juan, my friend. We're friends still, sure. am I true? Sure. Um, and I hope we stay friends. I mean, <laughs> did I do something wrong? Or do you think it was just by accident? Or you think it was maybe the fresh air in Germany compared to the hot air in Spain? So, so what is your take on that case? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Stefan, for the question, for being the first discussing this nice case. We, we can learn a lot with this kind of cases. Clearly, in my opinion, there is a, a mistake here. Uh, the failure, uh, considering your hands for sure, is that uh, we need for immediate implant installation an intact book and bone plate. That is what literature says. Of course, in the front area, we know that uh, many times, probably 90% of the cases, are we are dealing with thin phenotype. So we are always in a risk situation in the front area. And as you can see in these slides, uh, we have two cases, a premolar with a thick and intact hook and bone plate, and also in the right side, an intact but a thin buccal bone plate. So just to in interrupt you for a second, so was it just a technical mistake or were, was it also a mistake of, of timing? You also see yeah. technical things which w you would do differently? I see two things. First is the indication, the timing. You are right. And second, probably technically managing the case, I would do some different tricks that I would immediately explain Please, Juan, with help my me case. Out. Yes. Um, we, we can see a, a case similar to yours. Is, this is the 11, the, the, the tooth number 11 with a fracture. And if you pay attention to the CBCT scan, you can see a thin a buccal bone plate, but intact buccal bone plate. That, for me, is mandatory. Then we go for the extraction of the teeth, of the tooth, sorry, you can see the fracture, but as you have just shown, it's very important to be aware that the buccal bone plate is intact. We have to touch it. Then we go on with the procedure. We prepare the hole for the implant installation, but before going to the implant installation, my point is that it's easier to graft the gap between, in this case, the, 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 the pin and the buccal bone plate. It's easier to do it. So you mean bringing the biomaterial all the way up to the apex? Sure, and mm -hmm. packaging perfectly yeah. without installing the implant. And once we have everything in, in, inside the hole, please, we are going to see the next slide. And finishing with the hole, we, we take off the, the spin and we immediately go with the implant inside with the perfectly cap uh, fillet. So this is the second point that I was talking about. And finally, we proceed with the definitive apartment, as you can see here. And finally, we proceed uh, with two stitches just to stabilize the coagulum that for sure is very important and is mandatory to maintain this buccal and also thin uh, and intact uh, uh, bone plate. And at the end, we finish with the, with the case, with first with a provisional prosthesis for sure, and finishing with the uh, definitive prosthesis. And you can see then the preapical x-ray and also in the CBCT scan, how um, we deal with this buccal bone plate, as you can see, and I highlight in this CBCT scan. So in, from my point of view, there are two important aspects. The biological aspects that we have to consider for obtaining 
a, a, a nice result, and, and this is the indications, and this goes with the timing, and also the different tricks that allows us to, to get a, a perfect taste, let's say. So, no German air? It's not responsible, it's well, the German hands, is that what you're saying? Well, German, I'm not going to say the hands, but maybe the brain. We, <laughs> have, <laughs> we have to pay attention to the brain, and sorry well, for this. Too paradoxical, now it gets we difficult. Are <laughs> Sven, what is your take? If you look from a pros prostodontic view into these cases, is there something you, you could give us as a hint? I think if we go back to the radiograph, and if we are very critical, about the positioning of the implant, we could see that the implant is a little you bit... In the radiograph that Juan has yes, just showed exactly. us. Exactly, this yes. one. Yeah. Yes, it's a little bit off axis. And I think that's one point with immediate implant placement, that it's very difficult to get the implant in the correct three-dimensional position. And this ends up with a prosthetic part. And if you look at the, the radiograph, you see that the approximate part to the mesial is a little bit bigger than to the left. And for the moment, it looks really great. It's a perfect aesthetic outcome. But I, I don't know how this will look like in three to five years, because the implant position has also an influence on the stability of the heart as well as of the soft tissues. So um, just for this case, uh, maybe the, the computer-aided implant placement would be helpful instead of doing it freehand. Is, is that the reason why, in case of doubt, you would rather delay a case and prepare the case? So, sort That's of changing it from complex to simple? And, and, and would, would you not, elucidate a little yeah, bit on exactly. that? Yeah, exactly. That's the point. I would not say simple. I would say less complex. And that's, I think, the approach that I'm going to defend this night, the late implant placement. And maybe I can also share a case with you to... to explain uh, the late implant placement. And uh, that's the clinical case. And uh, this lady is unfortunately going to lose the left canine. We have to look at the soft tissues first. Um, you could see that there was a recession on the buccal aspect. There was no keratinized uh, gingiva anymore. And um, the reason why I had to extract this canine was the root fracture, which was already shown. And uh, when I look at the extraction alveol, I think it's very, very challenging to place the implant immediately in the correct three-dimensional uh, uh, position. And we are all experts, I would like to remind you. And Donnie and myself, we consider ourselves also as experts when we ski in Switzerland. Yeah, that's and true. we can go down any slope in Switzerland. And uh, in Switzerland, the, the difficult slopes are marked in, in black. And if you look at the picture, it clearly says that this slope is a difficult one. But if you look at the people who would like to go down this difficult slope, they, have, they struggle a little bit. And coming back to implant dentistry, I think we need to provide dentists a safe approach uh, to replace a missing tooth in the anterior maxilla, which is also predictable. And looking just at these two clinical scenarios, I performed an alveolar ridge preservation. And I ask you, which side would you prefer to place the implant? Which one is less complex? It's still an implant placement. You have to be careful. Mm -hmm. How did I do this? I just placed some bone substitute at, uh, right after the extraction. I covered it with a connective tissue graft. I admit that's not an easy procedure, but I had to do that <laughs> to compensate for the soft tissue deficiency. And by doing this, I could preserve the alveolar dimensions, the soft tissues, as well underneath the bony tissues. And I can wait four to six months. It's even, I can wait nine months because it will stay there. So I'm somehow not stressed anymore in this approach. It's a late approach, could be four. Maybe the patient is not available after uh, six to eight weeks, uh, or maybe uh, anything goes wrong. So I'm really safe. And there's a study by Kai Fischer, also Stefan Fickel, and I was also luckily part of this uh, clinical study because I did the volumetric measurements. And we compared three different treatment modalities to do this alveolar rich preservation. And it doesn't really matter which technique we apply. 
but important is that we apply something. And then by this, we can preserve the volume. Still, we lose around one millimeter of the buccal volume. But if we don't do anything, is shown in T4, we lose up to 2.5 millimeter of the buccal contour. So I think that's uh, very important to know. And uh, it makes this complex uh, treatment a more easy treatment. It's not simple. Um, still, you have to understand where is the prosthetic part. It's still not in the middle. You have to place the implant a little bit more to the palatal. But um, there was no need for further GBR, no need for soft tissue augmentation anymore. And by this, I could take the two months later the digital impression. Because the implant is placed correctly, prosthetically, I can provide the implant or restore the implant with a screw retained implant crown, one piece, very easy to handle. It's a zirconia crown, slightly veneered on the buccal aspect. And before I deliver this crown, I check always the clinical situation. And that's shown here. I could preserve the buccal contour, I think, very well. The peri implant mucosa looks healthy, so I'm fine. So I could screw fix the implant crown. I took the radiograph to check if everything is fine. Uh, the marginal bone level looks fine. Uh, the crown perfectly fits onto this implant type. And uh, by this, I could achieve I think, a good aesthetic result with, and I made it a little bit more easier for me. I also, if we go back to the session before, it was a little bit less stressful also. And we know that uh, when we are stressed, maybe we are not doing uh, the best performance. And um, there is also a study looking at the aesthetic outcome when we do these different approaches, immediate, late, or early implant placement. And they evaluated those cases after three years and they looked at the aesthetic outcome. And um, with the late implant placement, they reached in 50% of the cases an excellent clinical result, which is very good compared to the immediate implant placement, which was only in the case in one out of four. So that's, I think, a, a safe approach to achieve a good aesthetic result and also a stable result. But what is also important, maybe there Danny can add uh, uh, his uh, knowledge about, is that for the early implant placement, we see that the clinically unacceptable cases, they had only a few, the fewest compared to immediate or late. And that may be interesting to, to discuss also. Juan, are you figuring that they're picking on us because we have the smaller mountains? We won't let them get away with this. Okay. Okay. But let's go back to the next expert's gear. Um, <laughs> Dani, if I look at that study in detail, um, it looks to me that um, the early implant approach seems to be the safest if we look at the standard deviation of all of these approaches. I mean, we're all clear that the immediates are risky. And we're all clear that also the socket and ridge preservation cases are risky and they also depend on healing and whatever. So, what is your take? Could the early, now, because now we have the two extremes, right? So we have immediates and we, we're delaying a case of five to six months. So could like be a, an in-between in approach, which of course you're favoring, could that be a solution? And, and, and what is your take on that? Yeah, very interesting. And uh, I think uh, it's important to discuss today that uh, we should not say that's the safest because today we talk about case selection and you can do in an, let's say, very favorable anatomic situation, very uh, likely an immediate implant placement and achieve an excellent result. And in a very difficult case, you should never do it. So therefore, uh, it's very difficult to say what is the safest. And therefore also, when I hear, like yesterday, we have not done a randomized clinical trials on this issue, this is complete nonsense. Eh? Because when we have very difficult clinical situation, we all know should not be immediate, then we cannot do a randomized clinical trial and give patients then by intention and approach that does not work. You see, I think the case selection is important. And you see here that uh, I, today I, I love to discuss it like this. You see, when I do an extraction, I want to know what are we going to do. So the treatment plan for that case is established. 
and I would say if I have all three options open, I need a cone beam CT to know exactly what's the anatomy. And then I, no, 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 I'm sorry, I have to keep my hands here. So go one back. You see that <laughs> on the top is Juan's approach. Eh? So his approach is pull the tooth and place an implant. So patient walks in and walks out with the tooth. In my experience, I do that since four years. Very elegant technique, but I do that in, in the moment in 5% of my cases. Very strict selection. I might do more often uh, that in three to five years or whatever, you see. Uh, the last one, what, uh, what we heard from Sven, you see that you extract and you plan to place the implant in four to six months the earliest, then you have to do a soccer grafting. Otherwise, you lose too much volume. And then this approach I use more and more often, in particular in the premolar area or molar area for elderly patients where I want to minimize morbidity. And in well, well, what is your take on the additional soft tissue grafting? Because is, is that necessary in a lot well, of cases? But that was in this case necessary if you go for late placement. Now, when you do an early placement, you see that would be in between. Huh? That means you pull the tooth and then you, do, you want to get a spontaneous healing of the socket. But only for a short period of time before you go back in. Then I will show you that actually this gives you a chance. Not only you're going to lose the bone at the buccal wall because of bundle bone resorption, but you also get a spontaneous soft tissue thickening. So here you see these are my indications. When the facial wall in the moment is thin, that means half a millimeter or so, 0.8 millimeter, then uh, I don't go for immediate implant placement. I might change that when I have a case with a low lip line situation, patient 75, and the aesthetic is not highest priority to replace the tooth. Then I would probably uh, use an also immediate implant placement in the future. Narrow diameter is an option then also. You just have to fill the gap. You get the flattening, as we have seen, a millimeter on average in your study. And uh, when this is a low lip line situation, I think that's acceptable. Hmm? But when I have a high demanding case, and this is uh, less than a millimeter, then I go for early. The other one is when we have a chronic infection uh, there for months or years, and there is no bone there at the day of extraction, then uh, immediately is no way. And early can only be done if there is enough bone in the apical area so I can expect good primary stability of a perfectly placed implant in the correct position with good primary stability. So I not only need a thin wall or no wall, I also need enough bone in the periapical area to go for this approach. Otherwise, I have to go to Sven's approach. And as I said, I use that often uh, these days, uh, mainly in elderly patients. What you need is a horizontal cut as you see at the bottom there. Huh? And that means you measure what width do you have, the volume of the bone. And I know from our study we did in Bern, you see in eight weeks, nothing will change measly and distally to this tooth. This will change later on if you just let it heal and get a trophic. So now these are the schematic drawings. Huh? And uh, I want to show you, and they are actually in the upcoming uh, GBR book. Uh, you see a thin wall, we know this is going to resolve. You go one back, please. I'm sorry with my hand. Uh, the thin wall, we know from studies, is resorbing. And then this is bundle bone resorption. We all know the paper by Raujo. You see, we have to acknowledge that. That's the best cited paper in the dental literature in the last 20 years. Uh, more than 100 citations per year. It is astonishing. But it shows the significance of the impact of that paper. So we know. So this is reducing. You're going to lose a lot. Huh? In the study we did in Bern, you see we had on average 7.5 millimeter vertical bone loss in thin wall phenotypes. It's mid-facially. The beauty of that study that was shown, we did not expect that, is that actually you get an ingrowth of soft tissue there. And you get a thickening of that in that alveolus. So the bone is not growing all the way up in, uh, in two months. So don't do a soccer graft in a case when you want to place an implant at six or eight weeks. That would be a mistake because you get free of charge a thick buccal flap hmm, for the later surgery. 
And for that reason, those who are using this technique, I'm not using on routine any connective tissue grafts in my routine patients. I, huh? Well, that's uh, different for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah, it's a big advantage. So we might have in 100 cases, in 5% of the cases, not an ideal healing, and then we might do then a secondary correction with a tunnel technique. So there are some cases, but on a routine, there is no need for connective tissue graft. When we place the implant, of course, it has to be in a correct position. And then we are doing this two-layer composite graft. And that's very important. If you go with a DBBM, as we all know, uh, it has no osteogenic potential. And I can show it to you here now on this case. I, I brought you a case I did in 2006. That was a long time ago. It has not changed the technology. We learned in the meantime, so today we even get slightly better results. But the, the, the principle has not, has not changed. So the extraction is done flapless minimizing the trauma. We don't want to uh, uh, mobilize that flap. Then we wait six, eight weeks for the center incisor, and then we open it up. May I interrupt you? Yes. My question, is it it's still difficult to place the implant in this situation? No, no that's not difficult. Yeah, because you're an expert. No, 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 no. I'm not and an you expert. have the experience, yeah. but still, like the anatomy to place it as you did mm -hmm. perfectly, mm -hmm. is still very demanding. Yeah, not so, okay. Uh, the question for me, I, I, I would like to touch on that point is, in, in how many points will it not be feasible to place the implant? So that means you will have to delay the whole case for no. a major bone augmentation. No. No, I tell you frankly, when you do the connect, uh, when you do the CBCT, and you know your anatomy, there was not a single case I had to stop my search and say we cannot do it. So that works. Uh, we all know you check how much bone is available. You go in there with your round burr into the palatal structure, what we already heard, and then of course you go in here because the height is never a problem. You go in here with a 10 or 12 millimeter implant, and then uh, you get a very nice step stability. The preparation is an advanced procedure. That's but my that, point. That's my point. But when, when we have already cited the SAC before, you see, the SAC classification clearly shows any implant placement in the aesthetic zone is at least advanced. Eh? There's no straightforward cases. So if somebody is not doing, let's say, on a routine basis implants, he should not place implants in the central incisor. So I think that's the point. So, but the beauty of this approach is you get a two-wall defect. Because you know your width, you put the implant in, so you have a crate-like defect. We called it in the early GBR days at the Hissens type defect in the crestal area. So it's two ball, that's very favorable. And you see the occlusal view there at the bottom left, you see. Now then we do the augmentation. And the two layer composite graft is using a highly osteogenic filler, which is the patient's own bone. And that is actually harvested in the vicinity. There is no need to go to the chin or to the retromolar area. We take it actually at the nasal spine or we take it lateral to the, to the nose, you see towards the, nasal fossa, and we just fill up the defect. That's all we do. Huh? And the second layer is a low substitution filler. It hasn't been mentioned before. DBBM, I don't want to use the brand name here. Everybody knows it. Because that will not contribute to the osteogenic potential, but we know the beauty of that filler is that it does not resorb during the remodeling later on. So it is for volume stability. Then comes the membrane, and here, of course, we have changed in the 90s, as we heard already by Isabella so beautifully in the previous session. We changed in the mid-90s to collagen membranes because there it's much easier to apply. There's no need for fixation device in a case like this, and it's actually much less uh, susceptible for uh, complications. No need for removal because there is no second open flap procedure. Then we close it up, that's very important for me, because all the good studies are done with, with a submerged healing. You need to release the flap, yes, that will cause some swelling to the patient, but a tension-free closure is very important. But that means you're working with bone level implants? No. That but if you want to no. primary close it? No, 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 no. You see, you have to change your mind. You see, a tissue level implant has been used as a submerged implant since 1998. And uh, I'm very happy now, as we have heard, you see that some of these bone level type implants will finally 
come out uh, with a hybrid design with a little bit of machine surface in the crestal area because that will be a huge progress in the future because it will minimize the risk for the development of peri-implantitis if you get a little bit more resorption than expected. So also I do that also with, uh, <laughs> with uh, tissue level implants, but of course we place them so deep that we can easily submerge, you see, that we do. Two months of healing is a routine since 2010. Then we do a very careful reopening and then we do a provisional restoration for soft tissue conditioning. Also the routine stuff. Eh? So we let the tissue grow, the papillis uh, will develop if the bone is there as we have heard before. And now I show you the, the, the patient 10 years later, you see, because I think long-term stability is a, is a key issue. And we have actually, this lady was uh, one of 20 patients we, uh, we documented up to 10 years. Of course, we have been criticized. This is only case reports also in the, in, in the quasi a, a prospective case series study. But it was, a patient, it was a study with 20 cases and we published uh, after 10 years, 20 cases. We show them all. All of them were depicted clinically, radiographically and with a cone beam. So we could show one of the 20 cases did not grow the bone, so actually was absent, so was non-successful, still in place, no infection at that time, so surviving implant, but non-successful. You see here now on the right side the periapical, and you see that we have been able to regrow that bone very nicely and maintain it, and of course you see the, the, the peak of the buccal wall is, is actually 1.5, almost 2 millimeters uh, coronal to the implant shoulder. And that's the important part uh, to have a mucosal stability there. You see, if that bone uh, resorbs, then of course the mucosa goes down. And we all know the mechanism. Now I show you a, a, a last slide. Uh, this is actually a, a more recent case. You see, I said we have improved in the meantime. We learned, we did some clinical study on cell biological approach to learn actually what's the potential of autogenous bone chips. And we learned and we have published 12 papers now on it. You see, with Reinhard Gruber, Rick Myron, uh, Jordi Gabaye from uh, Barcelona, and lately now uh, in charge of the lab is now Maria Sparova, a cell biologist. Eh? And what we learned is that when you take a torsionous bone right after the flap elevation and put them in a mixture of blood and, and uh, sterile saline, that within 10, 20, 30 minutes, you get a strong release of growth factors into that blood mixture, mainly TGF beta 1, which is a very important uh, growth factor. And then what we do actually, we take that blood mixture and activate the DBBM particles, and we could show that all of a sudden, DBBM is, has an osteogenic potential. So we were able with this knowledge, you see, to change the surgical technique. You see how we have done it in this case here. And, uh, and you see, uh, it was also page with Professor Belser from, uh, who has been working now for 10 years in, in Bern as a retired professor. Uh, three years later, two centuries in size, it's very difficult uh, situation. And look uh, the bone we have achieved. Uh, one implant in an area 11, uh, more than three millimeters, the other one about 2.5 millimeters. So this is an approach I use, as I said, today in about 70 to 80 percent, less than 10 years ago, because I have now the other two options as well. And I'm very happy with them. So I think we're going to discuss now case selection and what are the selection criteria. Danny, thank you. Um, I think, Garrett, what we already learned, uh, there's no easy way. So no. Uh, all of them, they have their delicate surgeries. I mean, Juan, Juan is having it at the time of immediate implant placement. Sven is also having it at the time of tooth extraction because this is also delicate handling with grafts, handling in a non-submerged environment. But Dani, also your approach is technique sensitive. After six weeks, it is difficult to be clear to, to place the implant also in a perfect prosthetic uh, situation and to overgraft it and also to primary close it because you need additional volume. So that means you have to release a lot these flaps. You need to be trained. You see, mm -hmm. it's not a problem to close it, but of course, when you add volume, you need to release uh, the flap. That's no question, and uh, then uh, it's actually 
Yeah. Yeah. But what I'm surprised is a little bit that I did not see for the immediate implant placement, but also for the early implant placement, a guided approach. Okay, we can discuss I think, that. I think that's a, an important part because there I see a really a benefit for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think it's a good discussion. I mean, um, I mean, is, is it necessary to do guided? I mean, I guess, Danny, in your approach, you have full sight. I mean, okay, why would you, you guide? When I do immediate placement, it's always computer assisted and it's always flapless because when we talk about we should offer our patients approaches that minimize the morbidity or the invasiveness. And if they really want to profit from an immediate approach, then it should be flapless. And computer guided is very important from, from my point of view, because when you look at the, the publications reporting on these disaster cases, 50% of these cases the disaster was also caused because of a facial malposition. We all know you put an implant in and you hit you part of, about the cortex and then yeah. the implant moves outside. Huh? When a, uh, uh, we all know that problem. So I think I'm very happy with computer-assisted implant placement. When I do an early placement, single tooth, uh, and I have all these landmarks in the neighborhood, then I don't need it. The moment I move to two or three or four, computer-assisted. One, I mean. Well, computer assisted is uh, is another question, is another topic. But um, uh, if we go for for an immediate implant installation in the best uh, scenario with uh, the whole things there in the anatomy, you have everything there. This means that probably you don't need the uh, guided assistance implant installation. I'm not going to say that it's better to do it with that. But that I think the reality is that we have seen many, and read the paper by Stephen Chen, huh? yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the, the, uh, one of the most experienced surgeons at that time in, in, in Australia. Um, I don't know how many cases of the whole area of Melbourne and 50% have been malpositioned implants because all freehanded. So I think we should not neglect the progress we have from, from, from industry. Sure, sure not. Is it, sure Daniel, not. I heard you say I, I see a change yeah. in how I divide my cases yes. between immediate, uh, late or early. Is that because of the guides and the digitals new available? Or, or why do you actually say in the beginning I'm doing more and more immediate, I hear you say? Okay, I would say the following. I have seen tremendous disaster case early 2000 and that's I became very against it. I mean, I, I remember big battles at uh, European meetings, but also by others who said this is risky. Huh? Then, of course, we have learned from Araujo, so we start to learn, understand the biology. And then we have seen, of course, since 2010, I would say the progress in digital technology. So uh, I, I took a sabbatical in 2016, went to Herman Gallucci six months, and said, I want to really see how they do that. I came back home to my department and we installed everything for digital technology, teamed up with the Bros guys, and then we started. And therefore, I think I started to do my first immediate cases in 2017. I've done about 25 so far. I'm very pleased with it, uh, but uh, very carefully selected. Mm -hmm. But friends, shouldn't we make it a little bit more concrete? I mean, we yes. like to talk about <laughs> cases and Juan, as we are friends again, I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna make the next try of convincing you about my hands. <laughs> um, <laughs> you wanna see another case of mine? Yeah, yeah, but uh, let me say something. I, I agree that there are different timings, but I agree also that case selection is the critical issue yeah. because there are different indications and probably we are the three of us where in, or the Fifth of us, we're in the same line. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then, Juan, then we don't have a debate. Eh? So we're really we looking the for the fuzzy we edges. We have the debate because sometimes I don't agree with them. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, yeah, we are, we're looking a little bit into the gray zones because, ah. I mean, of course, I mean, there, there are differences. We have the house, of course, where we have the scheme of indication. But there are small differences, sure. and I want to dig out these small differences one, eh? now. So, so I, th I think the debate is on what, how are your selection criteria 
yours and mine. Huh? Yeah. Exactly. And there are differences. You see, I, I say I 5% in the moment, immediate, he will say 40%. I don't know, depending on his selection criteria. But I think uh, the, the, the main line we have to say, you see, we have to select the case mm -hmm. to satisfy the expectation of our patients. Okay, now, so, guys, let's see your look case. Look at that case. I have a canine for you. Is this following um, treatment or is this before? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry don't, to say that, but don't, this is actually... Danny, don't distract the two. <laughs> <laughs> distract <Yeah. it. laughs> Because the periodontists are quite conservative in that case. Yeah, very nice. Um, so look at that canine, friends. Um, we have a quite critical situation. We have to extract that tooth because of an invasive internal resorption. Yeah. Um, Danny, I hope you're in line with that. Absolutely. So that's before treatment, I have my seen friend. Many of them. <laughs> <laughs> the endodontic treatment, it doesn't work there. No? Yeah. Yeah. So, guys, let's look at the case and be serious. We're experts. So, um, we have a clinical situation which is actually challenging. I mean, we have a high scalloping, we have a canine which is. As all of you know, it's, 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 it's quite protruding out of the maxilla. So if we look at the next slide, we will see that this canine is a little bit off the jaw, which is normally the case. And um, now we have a rather thin parental biotype. We actually haven't talked so much about mm -hmm. biotype and thickness of soft tissue. So we have another hour for that, Garrett? No. Um, so, and now we look at the radiograph and um, this is the situation, friends, which I'm facing. And I'm sitting over these radiographs. I'm sitting in front of this patient and he asks me what to do. I mean, we have um, a situation in the periapical, as you see it here, a little bit, a tooth off axis. Uh, we have a CBCT scan, which gives us the hint, I'd say, that there's a buccal bone plate, if ever uh, the buccal bone is truly thin. So now I would say that this is a case where we are a little bit in between. I mean, this is no clear cut. I think, um, Juan, we are in your scheme of indication for an immediate, it has an intact buccal bone plate, as at least what we see on the CBCT. So um, my first question goes to you. Before you do that, let's put our audience in the mix oh, yeah, and ask them to idea. take steak. Do we so, have a picture of the lip line? <laughs> well, let me introduce the vote and then we continue with that one as well. So you can actually now live participate in this primetime debate. I've just launched again a vote in our voting application. If you're new to this, you can just scare, uh, scan the QR code, which is either on screen or definitely below the live stream player here in the platform. And the question I've launched, what would you do in this specific case of Stefan in the left canine? Would you go for an immediate placement, a delayed, or late implant placement with rich preservation. Now, while you vote, let's listen how our experts here determine what you would do. So, Danny, what is missing? The lip line. You see, not very, only. Not only. Not only, of course not. But this is a very important aspect of the thickness of buccal wall is for me very important. Lip line, age of the patient. Age and expectations. And expectations, yeah. Very important, yeah. I think. Oh. Okay, in, Stefan. What can you say about that? So um, let's look at the lip line. So this is a patient in his mid 40s, and of course, dear friends, Danny, you really think at the prime time debate, I'm going to bring you a low lip line? No, sure not. Sure. Yeah. So uh, this is the oh, clinical but situation. Let's make it clear because we have viewers with all different kind of experiences. Why is it so important to look at the lip line first, guys? Uh, because then it's important that the soft tissue part becomes important. Mm -hmm. And if you do, do, are not careful and you end up with a long clinical crown, this could be a, an aesthetic failure at the end. Mm -hmm. So that's We've just why raised the stakes with this high uh, lip. Or you get a flattening and you get a, a dark shadow on top of your crown. They are patients, yeah. they complain that about may that I like crazy. You, but I think we should treat all the patients as if they were with a high lip line. Yeah, so that's an argument. That's the, the objective. Yeah. Juan, you, you say to them, I don't care about this lip line. Oh, I always no, assume. No, I don't care not. That is not the, the situation. I care for sure. Mm -hmm. But in, in my mind, mm -hmm. in my schedule, I need, uh, uh, I don't mind to the, the smile line because I have to, to construct mm 
the treatment planning and my case selection, just in case uh, the, the aesthetic is not going to be a problem. Yeah. You know? so, so, but to pick on that again, yeah. what does the lip line tell us for the timing? So, are, are you saying that immediate is more risky in a high lip line? Is that what you want to say? Or is that also like, that we have to be more careful as surgeons, as prosthodontists, no, if, no. if it's a no. high lip line? I tell you frankly, first, most important for me is the thickness of the facial wall. Hmm? So if that is thin or lacking or so, then it's clear immediate is out hmm. of the options. Huh? So if it's thin and the patient is 75 and has a low lip line situation, so high expectations are not high, then I think immediate. I could also consider an, an his approach, you see, soccer grafting, wait four months, do a flapless implant placement with a narrow diameter implant and the flattening I get will not be critical and the patient has the lowest morbidity possible because there's not a single flap raised. And I think there is, the lip line is important, you see. But of course, to get, to get an, uh, let's say, uh, with a high lip line, you get a flattening or you get a little bit of recession, then the patient will immediately complain about it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So mm. let, let's come back to the case. I think that mm. was a very good discussion about the, the, the lip line. Um, Juan, um, what is your idea? Do you really think um, it would be possible in this case um, to place an implant immediately? Yeah, this is uh, one of the cases that is in the borderline. This is clear. If we can show again the x-rays, uh, we can see clearly that from an anatomical point of view, there is a bulky root. And if also we have a very thin uh, buccal bone plate, and we don't see the buccal bone plate clearly in this You, in this you saw scan. that in the x-ray of the case of, uh, of Stefan, right? That is what yes, you're referring to. I would like to, to see again yeah, exactly. the, the x-ray. Just... Yes, one, one back, mm -hmm. one back. Yeah, it's yes, not, thank it's, you. It's and not really you can see that the, the, root, yeah. the root is out of the bone, the profile of the bone. And from an anatomical point of view, this is very important. Mm -hmm. But this could help you anchoring your implant. Yeah, but that oh, no, doesn't no, make... no, come on. No. Look at then the palatal aspect. You That's have enough palate, bone on the Look palate. at the profile no, I agree. in the vestibular aspect. You are going to lose a lot there. Yeah, That's That the is point. a problem because it's out of the box. Right. And in addition, you don't see clearly here the, 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 the buccal plate. You don't see it. Mm -hmm. So you, you can use your probing, uh, your probing to check the, the attachment level, but you are not really sure. So you so have to... What would to... that mean for you as a clinician? Would you expose it or would you just... No, 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 no. I, I would explain to the patient that the, this is a real borderline case and probably I should go for a, a type 2 implant installation because uh, when we extract this tooth, probably if we have the buccal bone plate there, it's going to go out. Mm -hmm. well, so if you had to vote right situation. now... Juan, Sorry? If you had to vote right now, like our viewers, you would go for type 2, meaning? Type 2, probably. The early placement. The early placement. Yeah. I think it's the more secure. Of, of course that we don't have any infection around. No, yeah. no infection. No. You know what? The late implant placement. So <laughs> extracting rich preservation can be applied in any case. And then do you become yes. time independent for your, for your procedure? Yeah, so this is, for the immediate, you really have to be careful in the selection of these cases. Mm -hmm. Also for the early. But for the late, that's an easy approach. And but when you uh, say, I offer you the safe option, just go for late. Oh, then. don't say yeah. safe. Not safe. That's wrong, you say. Uh -huh. but, but like, no. just make it less complex in the, because he, he said it right, in the anterior maxilla, it's any case is complex. It's advanced, yeah. Oh, and it's advanced. Or advanced. So therefore, I think it just reduces like the, the complexity. It, it reduces our stresses during the surgeries. And uh, mm -hmm. well, so let's be clear. What would you do? I mean, is that a, a case for a socket grafting plus soft tissue grafting? Here I would, uh, because we have no soft tissue deficiency, I would just cover it up. Um, could be a punch from the palate or could be also a kind of soft tissue substitute, yeah. which is available on the market. Um, I don't really care because there is no soft tissue deficiency. Mm -hmm. That's Can the, I the add point. something here in this case? Uh, uh, let me insist in the anatomy because if you go for uh, um, the type 4, uh, uh, you are going to graft the socket. I have that, to. 
Yeah. Yes, you, you have, have to. to. But in your study, you have always a standard deviation. Of course. This is not the mean, probably. It's out of the mean. Yeah. And you are going to obtain, probably, even you go for a socket graft, you are going to obtain a, 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 a collapse. Yeah. Because you see that there is, it's out of the box. And in these cases, the anatomy is, is not with us. No. That's true, but do I need this buccal contour for the, for the implant and for the implant uh, restoration? I don't think so. If you we, if we to have just follow the contour of the neighboring team, I would go to the type two. I think that, uh, that's enough. Can I explain why you What have would you do first? Start first on the vote? I want to explain the standard deviation on, on your study, huh? because this is not explained properly. We know. If we do an extraction and it's a thick wall, then you don't lose bone. If it's a thin wall, you lose a lot of bone. If you do an extraction and do a soccer graft and it's a thick wall, you don't lose anything. Huh? Yeah. And that is a very uh, favorable yeah. one. If it's a thin wall, you're going to lose one to two millimeters yeah. because the average is only one. So you might lose two millimeters. But if there's a thin biotype, I would add a soft tissue graft. Yeah, yeah but th that's the that's point. Another you surgery. lose more, and that, that means if you go for, let's say, for a high aesthetic result, you see, then uh, I'm absolutely sure you're going to place the implant six months later and do a simultaneous GBR because you want to get the contour back, you see. But and, just the soft tissue uh, augmentation. If, yeah, the, if the bone is there, I just yeah. need some mm -hmm. Danny, put your stakes on the table. What would you vote in this specific case? That's and I look has... at this case with the buccal wall is, is not really visible. For sure, it's not thick. So I think that if the patient is, let's say, not 85 or 80 years old, uh, where we want to minimize that surgical trauma or so, I think the early approach gives you a very predictable treatment. It's an open flap, as I said. I tell the patient that you're going to have for two or three or four days a swelling in your, but you're going to get three months later a very nice outcome, and that will stay there for a long time. We haven't discussed about the interproximal soft tissue hide, which, which is quite critical here. No concerns with your approach? No. no. You see, this has been, has been in the literature by one poorly done study from Germany. We all know it, you see. And then uh, we heard that from, from of course, from uh, our friend Dennis Tarnow. You have to do parapapillary in, uh, flaps or so. Nobody's doing that. When you do a flap, you mobilize because you want to have a large flap. When you do an augmentation like counter augmentation, I don't want to have these mini flaps because you always get a scar line then where you have your implant crown and patients complain about that heavily. Because it's not a problem in our, in our long-term study, 10-year study, the papillite was not a problem at all. Yes. And, and I, th I think we have a good fuzzy case mm. because we <laughs> have everyone digging in in their own position. And I think our audience is heavily divided. If we look at the results, we have a slight majority or, or a good majority for Sven, your late placement with rich preservation, but not even more than half of our viewers. The other halves are nicely divided ag uh, among the board. We see one third voting for the early placement as well, but even almost 25% going for immediate in this one. So in the last That's minutes amazing. of this debate, can we come to some good guidance on this audience of, of, of what to do when? So um, for me, um, let's, let's bring in all of you guys just for one more final sentence. I mean, Juan, what is the major point of immediate implants for our audience? Just two words. Intact buccal bone plate. Wow, that was clear. Clearly in the CVCT. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So and, and you say in this case, I saw enough. I would dare to I go for I don't see enough. You don't see enough. Yeah. So that's why you say I would go for the type two. Sven, yeah. did they convince you for an early implant placement or you stick with late? To be honest with you, uh, same with uh, Danny, I do few cases immediate. I do most cases uh, early and not late. And this, in this case, I would also go for an early implant placement. Um, but I think it's not an easy uh, approach because it's not only the implant placement, it's also the GBR procedure, Absolutely. which adds more complexity to the case. Mm -hmm. So you, if you can handle that, completely fine. If you feel unsafe, uh, maybe you should not treat the anterior maxilla. You should refer. First, you should refer. <laughs> if you would like to reduce the stress during your surgery, go for the late approach. It's always applicable, and you uh, will re 
result, the result will be very nice regarding the clinical outcomes. Mm -hmm. Are in they the, kidding? We, we have a consent of three experts. What no. are we doing? Should we bring in some questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a nice question. And I think this, this is a good final question to go out. It's a question from Lee Chi Hen, which came in early in the debate already. So how important do you think is the experience in the option you choose for treating the cases? Do you think you always try the treatment you're most comfortable with? We already talked about technique sensitive, about advancement. Is this a safe guidance? If you're not sure, go with your comfort zone. And uh, it is in the ITI consensus paper. You see, immediate implant placement is a complex procedure, should only be carried out by master clinicians. You, if you have maximum one case per year to do, don't do it. Then you go for early or delayed placement because this is difficult. And if you, if you run into a problem, you have a patient who's very, very unhappy. And that's not good for the buildup of a practice. So I think uh, to, to keep the risk low is always a good option uh, for those who are not placing 50 plus implants a year. Mm -hmm. Sven, agree? Uh, I completely, completely agree. Yes. We completely. all agree on yes. that. The one. less risky situation is type 4. Exactly. So is that then also where we obtain our learning curve? Is that how it goes? Because I, I hear it a lot in these digital days. Eh? It's only in the hands of a mass clinician. You should be experienced. And I keep wondering, so where do I gain my experience? How do I get up on that learning curve? And it, the question is, uh, is it really nice that every dentist is placing implants? That's a, big, that's a big mistake, you see. I strongly believe that you have to be trained in uh, surgical procedures, and this is always a postdoc uh, yes. education. This is not undergrad, you see. I mean, I've been in, in, a, in a dental school for 40 years, and you cannot train the undergrads to do implant surgery. There are no patients who would actually be the guinea pigs for that or whatever. So you need to be well trained, and then you need to have enough patience to build up the experience. If somebody is young and starts, I would not start with the most complex cases. Then you go for straightforward and build up the complexity level slowly uh, to gain more experience. And then you can walk to more and more difficult cases. So if we bring that to this primetime debate on timing, Stefan? Um, <clears throat> I think what I learned is that there's no easy way. I mean, um, everyone has his difficult surgeries. The immediate one has his difficult surgery at the time of implant placement and tooth extraction. The delayed one has his difficult surgery sometimes at the time of tooth extraction, in particular if you add soft tissue. But the, the, the early one is also tricky at the time of six to eight weeks post because it's difficult to anchor the implants, it's difficult to primary close. But with this, I think we can conclude it needs education and it definitely doesn't need every dentist to, to handle these clinical situation. And I think that could be a good concluding remark. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and just, just in time, I see Kai Fisher's uh, question uh, popping in. In terms of biomaterial, is that what and we saw you recommend very different biomaterials that we see others of you use? Mm -hmm. To what extent does that play a role when you choose your timing? Is that a, a factor? I see Sven already saying no. We use no. the same biomaterials. I think a, for each approach, it's the same biomaterial. Yeah, yes. regardless Both if we go for immediate or delay or type 4. But, but could it possibly make a difference? You see, if you use a torsionous bone, you just speed up the formation of bone in terms of the speed and the volume. So I think uh, if you look to, let's say, where they do the largest augmentations, like Istvan Urban, they're all using uh, the, 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 the composite graft. So the mixture of the patient's own bone and the DBBM with a low, sub, with a low substitution, volume stability uh, yeah. characteristics. You, you need see. two biomaterials, low resorption, and the still induction. Yeah. And, and regardless and of the timing you, you yeah, choose. Yeah. But still, how important is, is, is the autologous bone, uh, in particular if you graft at the, at the place of the implant? Mm -hmm. I mean, does, it, does this make a difference? I mean, we saw Juan placing DBBM material directly at the implant. Yeah. Is that something you do on a routine basis? Yes. And Danny, what are you, what are you a, layering? He at the has a three-wall defect, yeah. of course, it's a contained a, type defect. Mine is a two-wall defect. Right. It's a different and and the, the bone grows from the sideline, from these two walls. And if you have an osteogenic filler there, so the patient's own bone, 
you get within two weeks, you have a fully healed uh, 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 defect, which is bone, of course, immature bone at that time. And uh, this has been shown in animal studies very beautifully. And I think all the long-term studies we have done have been done with, uh, with this uh, composite graft. Yeah. Like in sinus floor elevation, I mean, yes. uh, there is even the better documentation. If you do sinus floor with TBAPM alone, you never get the same results, you see. That's very, very clear. Or, or even nothing. There are yeah. histology studies yeah. that uh, they show us that uh, in the sinus lift, without using nothing, you can obtain bone. And the beauty is uh, headed, you see, autogenous bone is free of charge. Yeah. You don't pay for it. That's why the industry well, is not pushing it exactly. because they cannot sell it. You see, but the patient pays for it with a, se with a second site, no? Or a, no. you graft it no, in the extension site? No, it's in the same site. area. The same area. No, exactly. no. So let's finally uh, look at the final results of our poll, uh, Stefan. The, the people are still across the board. We see some slight movement, but I guess uh, the majority of our audience also goes with, I guess, is somewhat the consensus here at the table, goes with the... No, actually, they go for the late. Yes. Right? So actually, Sven, I think you're... Uh, let's make things less complex. But is the patient... Well, that's a whole other debate. <laughs> the patient factors we take off air in the lounge, we talk I about think, that. I think at the end it's a, it's a good answer. Yes, because exactly. uh, dentists, uh, that they are not well trained. And, and training means that you have to be the whole life trained. Do you know who not is actually the observing? Studies. Do right. you know that? We know we have people from all over the world. We, we see them checking in in the chat. And we see them at hashtag EAO Digital Days as well. So keep sending in those selfies. That's fun as well. Yeah. So the question would be, what's the percentage of specialists and what's the percentage uh, of yeah. GPs? Is yeah. it? And Next vote, uh, where we that further would research. Perfectly explain uh, that. That's what oh. I meant. Mm -hmm. Stefan, we've come to the end of this primetime debate. Thank you very much for being the co-host. Thank you for the preparation. Thank you, dear speakers. Thank for you, Gary. Fresh format of both educating us in the first part briefly, and then trying to exchange and really help our audience understand where the boundaries of each approach is. Thank you very much for being with us. That was a very enjoyable debate. <laughs>